Welcome to Football and Society, a new podcast exploring societal issues through the lens of the beautiful game. I'm Chris Shipman, and I'm joined by Ash McMullen and Norman Riley. And over the next few weeks, we'll be exploring topics, including supporters' views on moving to a new stadium, community football initiatives in deprived neighbourhoods, and the experiences of female football officials in the UK. Today, though, we're looking at football clubs as symbols of regional identities. For many football fans, support for their team is linked strongly to local identity. The club for them represents a town or a region with which they strongly identify. In 2016, Adriano Gomez Bantel published an article focusing on clubs for whom regional identity has become a central aspect of the club's management, both on and off the pitch. Many listeners may already be familiar with the emphasis on regional identity among supporters of Barcelona, which became a prominent symbol of Catalonian cultural identity during General Franco's dictatorship, or Athletic Bilbao, whose team consists almost entirely of players born in the Basque region. While Adriano looks at these two examples in his article, his focus is on VFB Stuttgart, who have come to be recognised as the representative club of the Württemberg region in Germany. He argues that the construction and maintenance of a club's regional identity is a dynamic process involving several actors, including players, fans, the board of directors, and politicians. The club provides fans with an outlet for regional patriotism as they parade Württemberg symbols at matches, and politicians recognise the club's power to promote community and create identity, especially when the club is experiencing success. Adriano suggests that clubs like VfB Stuttgart must strike a balance between the pursuit of international corporate success and the commitment to the local community. Too much commodification, in his view, risks abandoning the charismatic attraction of the club for local supporters, and the club must therefore continue to cultivate its regional identity and maintain its commitment to the region. Adriano is a communications manager and public relations specialist based in Stuttgart, Germany. We're delighted to welcome him today to discuss his article on the Football Society podcast. Hi Adriano, thank you very much for joining us. Hello, thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. Adriano, I'd just like to begin by asking you why you decided to explore this topic. As your study? Well, um, this topic was part uh, um, at university. Um, I studied history in, in Tübingen, and um, my my main topic for the for the exam was um, uh, the VfB Stuttgart as a regional identification figure. Adriano, thank you. Um, first question: You write about uh, VfB Stuttgart and, in particular, their success in the the 50s, 1984, 1992, and how these titles bolstered regional pride. Is this still the case in an era of globalised sport where stadia of of Premier League clubs, uh, Bundesliga clubs, um, are surrounded by banners featuring, for example, in the UK, Cypress Spurs or or Hanoi Blues? Um, Yes, I think the clubs clubs also carry a regional identity also in the globalised world and... um, this can be deduced from the name of the clubs alone. In most cases, they are not uh, imaginary names. They always carry their city names and the fans celebrate these names. And even in a globalized world, uh, these clubs will play their home games in their hometowns. Um, that's normal. And anyone can ask um, what constitutes a particular club and what, it's, what is its identity. Um, and here you can see in which tradition, tradition a club stands. And here's an example. In FC Bayern Munich players have to appear in Lederhosen on certain occasions and celebrate their championship with Bavarian beer. So this is a clear regional reference for a club that currently has more than 55% of um, players from foreign countries. But um, we also see uh, traditions in the derbies. Uh, if you think of Newcastle versus uh, Sunderland games or, or Stuttgart against Berlin, or maybe Madrid against um, Barcelona. No matter how globalized the world is, the supporters of players or the teams are, some things are so deep in the core of the clubs um, that they remain part of their identity. And um, when fan clubs like the Cyprus Spurs or Hanoi Blues are formed, then I see a connection between two regions because these uh, fan clubs also have their... um, geographical names in, in themselves, like Hanoi or Cyprus. 
So they are connecting their, their home region with the region of the club. And the fact that um, regional location is still fundamental uh, to a club's identity today can also be answered by the question that every fan or supporter can ask himself. Would I still be um, a fan or a member of the club if it moved with all its players, staff and so on with the stadium to a completely different region? Norman, could you still identify with Newcastle if the club moved to Brighton but nothing else changed? <laughs> I'll tell you what. I love Brighton. I love the city of Brighton and going there to watch Newcastle play as an away fan is a wonderful, wonderful experience and a great day out. But if Newcastle United moved to Brighton, I think I would very much struggle to maintain my affection for the club. There's a quote, Adriano, in your article, um, and it's, when clubs are perceived as no more than economic units, the community does not feel warmly towards them. How do you square this circle when it comes to a club like RB Leipzig, which even its own fans admit is a branding exercise for Red Bull? You're right. That's a very good question. You have to see that the East German region is underrepresented in the Bundesliga. Apart from the two clubs from the capital, the two Berlin clubs, Leipzig uh, is the only club in the Bundesliga from the East. It means that um, um, Red Bull has filled a sporting vacuum and um, has given the people in the region a uh, sporting home in the, in the Bundesliga. And that there's a general reject, rejection of this kind of commercialization can be seen from all the other clubs, from the rejection that the other clubs uh, give them, or the rejection, rejection that Leipzig can experience from all the supporters from the other clubs. And with Leipzig, one has to bear in mind that the players and staff are only some kind of, yeah, they are only employees, really employees um, of an economic unit. And the club itself is only um, 19 members who can vote. So the fans cannot join the club. They can consume it and they can um, be members of fan clubs, but they cannot be member of the club itself. And um, yeah, in the end, this is how the fans are seen by the club as consumers and nothing more. But um, nevertheless, the sporting, uh, the desire for sporting prestige in top class sport uh, means that um, the, the fans of Leipzig probably overlook the fact that their city is represented by an international corporation and that Red Bull may regard them as, as euros, as walking euros. Nevertheless, there's um, one in interesting observation. Although Leipzig became third last season in the Bundesliga, the average number of spectators in the Bundesliga was only on place nine. Yeah, so by, by comparison, Düsseldorf uh, was relegated to second last, but had a higher average of numbers of spectators. Adriano, the ingredients as you see it for a strong identity are a regional pool of players, a board of directors with public commitments to the home region, and officials who confer regional identity. Does that, to some degree, underestimate the power of nostalgia for when those factors were the case? And I'm thinking particularly at Newcastle United, the club that I support, where there's still very much a strong sense of identity, even though those factors are no longer present in any meaningful sense. Yeah, these factors can give rise to a very strong sense of a regional identity, um, but they are not a requirement for regional identity. Um, so. Uh, the idea of having a pool of regional players and a board of directors coming from the region was uh, born in the 50s in, in Stuttgart. I think it was the, the president of the club um, wrote, he wrote that um, it is necessary to have players from the region because they want to play for the region. They, have, um, they are playing better than because um, they, are, they are playing for the home, home region. But um, for today, I think this is not so important anymore especially since football has become a business and the concept of neighborhood workforce is hardly possible now. Um, but I think that the fans themselves are becoming increasingly, increasingly important as identity-forming factors. Uh, for today, I view the fans and members are more important than the business aspect uh, in regards to of the um, identity. If the fans refer to the club's history and regard themselves and their club as regional or assign it to a milieu, then that is the way it is, no matter how the board of management or the players see it. 
because the employees or the players and the managers, they will come and go. But the fans, they will stay for years. Homegrown players are, are clearly key to fostering a sense of identity and engagement on the part of the local population. Do you have any thoughts, Adriano, on how those loyalties are tested when a much-loved local player leaves or falls out with the club? So one example is actually Timo Werner at Stuttgart, and there's also Messi at Barcelona. Yes, with um, Timo Werner, it was a great disappointment for the fans um, and that this player moved to Leipzig. I, I can remember this. And um, when Timo Werner came back um, for a match between Leipzig and Stuttgart, Fans had had some chance for him. The Stuttgart fans attach great importance to tradition, and Leipzig um, embodies exactly the opposite. And that was um, really hard for Stuttgart. Messi, for example, has now played in Bundesliga uh, in Barcelona for so long that I believe the, uh, he embodies this club so much that the fans would still sing his name after uh, he left. And uh, I think this is um, similar to Maradona in Naples, for example. When he's near Naples, um, the people will still sing, sing his name 20 or 30 years uh, later. But I've also heard from supporters that they themselves em embody the club. Players are just their employees. They are playing for them. So the fans are the constant of identity. But a character like Messi, who has been with uh, his club for over 20 years, takes on a different role with the fans. He also embodies the club. Are homegrown players conceptualised as those born and raised in the region, or does it extend to those who progressed through the academy regardless of where they were born and spent their formative years? You mentioned Messi a few minutes ago. I think in today's world, the place of birth, of birth um, plays a lesser role. But what is, what, it's important, what is important is whether the players can embody the region, for example, through typical dialect or character traits. And there's already in there, it already plays a role um, whether one has spent a long time in the region of the club. Nevertheless, uh, born and raised uh, seems like, like a promise that this player embodies the identity of the home region uh, of his club and also that he is, for example, one of us. Yeah, tying into that particular question, I guess with the growth of far right sort of populism in Europe and obviously in the United States as well, but in Europe in this particular context, my concern with identity and regionalism and, and national pride is that obviously this is something that is almost used by, by far right parties to help along their, their more nefarious goals. And, and it got me thinking, um, would a would a player with a, a non-white ethnicity who would progress through the academy fit into the conceptualization of someone from that region? Um, so, you know, is there a kind of racialized element to the concept of local region identity? Is, was that something you picked up on perhaps during your studies? So uh, for me, I'm sure that uh, ethnicity doesn't matter. And going through the academy is not that important either. And what matters is that the player can embody the club and the region. And these are mostly players who feel personally connected to the region or the club. And that depends on how long you live somewhere. You have to see um, building up bonds and relationships takes time. It's, it's like uh, two people building up a friendship. So I would deny that ethnicity plays a role here. But I know there are also people who have a different, different view on this. You mentioned politicians using the club's influence to further their own political agendas. And considering what Norman's actually mentioned about the current growth in support for far-right political movements in Europe, for example, in Germany itself, the AFD claimed almost 6 million votes in the 2017 elections. Um, and given the importance of identity and the strength of the sentiment of difference between the fans of VFB and Karlsruhe, as representatives of two separate regions. Do you feel that fans of such clubs are or have the potential to be sites of future political contestation? So, in other words, an inter-fan rivalry between those at separate points on the political spectrum? I think that the fan culture of football clubs is always an indicator for society. If a society is divided, rivalries also arise in football. Just as the region can be a factor for identity, the social milieu can also ref reflect identity. For example, right against left, 
workers against uh, bourgeois, Catholic against Protestant, or even traditional club against marketing club. Today's fan rivalries too are usually uh, the result of historical rivalries that arose through political events that divided society. So um, um, uh, the, the rivalry between Stuttgart and Karlsruhe comes from, from a political event in the past. And I think it's the same for, same for Newcastle and, and, and the rivalries um, they have. And for example, for Celtic Glasgow against the Rangers, yeah, or Barcelona against Madrid. So football is um, uh, more than just a sporting event. It's a reflection of society. And yes, some politicians want to take advantage of this and they occupy football. Something that we've seen historically in the UK is far-right groups recruiting fans at games. Do you feel that far-right politicians and groups that are mirroring those in the UK, like the so-called Democratic Football Lads Alliance, are they attempting to recruit at games in Germany as well? I'm quite, I'm quite sure that um, extremists um, also want to recruit supporters among football fans. Whether this is successful depends on the constitution of the society because this is reflected in the club. In a right-wing society, for example, it becomes easy for an extremist to recruit people. But if the society is open-minded, it becomes very difficult because no fan wants to isolate himself by joining the extremist my minority. But the larger these extremist groups become, the more successful they become in recruiting because then at some point they are established. Moving on to your work on Spanish clubs, Adriano. Um, you mentioned Athletic Bilbao as a representation of Basque identity and a source of pride. The club has a policy of um, employing players of Basque heritage um, and obviously this no doubt fosters an incredible attachment and loyalty amongst fans and players at the club. I can talk from personal experience when I see a, a young lad come through who is from Newcastle, has a similar accent to me, um, somebody I guess I can relate to regardless of their age. It, it makes me feel a, a real strong sense of pride. Um, however, with regards Bilbao, do you see this as being problematic on any level? I guess I'm referring here to the possibility of it being perceived as a, a type of xenophobia? Um, here too, Basque society must be considered in its totality. It's, it's all about society, I think. Uh, the Basque country is part of Spain, but it has its own language, culture, and, and the people have their own character. The, the language, the Basque is the oldest uh, living language in Europe. So they have their own, own culture and they want to be seen as Basque. And I think that um, this case is less about xenophobia, but what could play a role is the focus on their own identity. We have to take a look at history too, uh, here too. Um, under Franco's dictatorship, the Basques were oppressed. They, the use of the Basque language, for example, was banned. And it is quite natural that the need to express independence develops from this. So I see this less as a rejection of foreigners and more as an emphasis on one, one's own identity, which has been suppressed for so long. Very understandable. Um, and does a, a division such as that exist between the Catalan region or the Basque country and the Central Spanish Authority exist in Germany, given that it's a federation of states? Or do you believe that the region and club, Wales being a source of regional pride, very much feel part of a wider Germany and therefore the regional identity and the national identity go hand in hand? Um, the Basque and the Catalans have a great independence movement. The political objective of separation from the central state uh, is widespread. They have, they have their own parties for separation. But there's no um, serious political independence movement in Germany. Of course, the, the individual regions like Bavaria or, or Württemberg maintain their regional identity, but this cannot be compared with, um, with uh, Spain where there are um, separatists. So there's a division in Germany between East and West. That is the territory of the Federal Republic in the West and the former GDR, German Democratic Republic in the East. But in my view, Germany is uh, more about the merging of two parts of the country that belong together and were separated by a historical catastrophe and not about um, aspirations for independence. In this respect, I believe that uh, regional and national identity are indeed consistent. You mentioned the charismatic attraction of regional clubs. Do you think this 
charismatic attraction is becoming less important to potential fans. So does the appeal of big names and international success cast a bigger influence in the modern game? So, for example, are Bayern Munich now a more appealing team to youngsters from Württemberg? Yes, big names and um, big names and sporting success um, do indeed uh, ensure a larger fan base. Nevertheless, clubs like um, Bayern Munich know how important identity is. Um, and FC Bayern cultivates its image as a Bavarian club with its slogan, Mia San Mia. I don't know if you um, know this slogan, but uh, in Germany, always when you hear FC Bayern, you always also hear um, Mia San Mia, which is Bavarian dialect and means we are ourselves. Just like Thomas Müller are absolute um, fan favorites and identification figures. And why is it uh, that... Um, Müller is such a fan favorite. It is because um, he is an absolute Bavarian um, person. And, uh, however much Müller tries to speak standard German, you can always hear the Bavarian slang. He cannot, so he cannot really um, speak the standard German. Um, that means that this club, this club takes both aspects into account and is therefore particularly attractive. It's uh, this regional identity coupled with Success is like a trademark that even people in Asia find appealing. Yes, but of course, um, Bayern Munich also has an enormous appeal in Germany with many supporters all over the country, even in Württemberg. But we have um, all gone through this youth age where, where, where we orient ourselves um, towards the best. Um, but a genuine, genuine um, deep bond with the club is independent of international a success and depends more on how you look at yourself and whether you set your self image matches the club. I do not consider the core uh, of football fans to be opportunistic. When um, Stuttgart played in the second Bundesliga last season, they had an average of 51,000 spectators. And Hamburger SV also played in second Bundesliga last season and had an average of 47,000 spectators, spectators. And now let's compare this with Leipzig. They had an average of 40,000 spectators, spectators. This is number nine in Bundesliga. And uh, although they were the, on the third place in the Bundesliga and played Champions League. So uh, there must be some, something that is more important to the supporters than, than only the sporting success. And this shows me that international success does not necessarily win people's hearts. Well, as a Newcastle fan, that's quite heartening, I, uh, I must say. <laughs> In the globalized world that we live in, is it to some degree a paradox to try and satisfy the demands of an ultra modern business like we have in football in the 21st century, while also preserving sacrosanct regional traditions? How can a club strive to be successful internationally without sacrificing its particular local appeal? It sounds a little bit paradoxical. The clubs adapt to the rules of economy. And in fact, um, they have to do so in order to remain competitive. And many club leaders also see their clubs as companies and nothing more. But I think it is very important to ask yourself who or what is the club? Are the players the club? Are the managers the club? Or is it the fans? Is it, is it the members? I think a, a club is embody, embodied by its members. And so the fans and the members are far more than consumers of a product. They they are the club. It's about, it's about the fact that the professional uh, sport is firmly inserted by the economic aspect. The club leaders understand that region, regional traditions and participation are very important so that the clubs have a face and appear attractive. So it is also possible that the regional identity is used for mar marketing purposes. Other marketing strategies may be used abroad in different countries or maybe the regional identity may be exported as some kind of brand core. In this way, they, they manage to be successful regionally and also internationally. To what extent is this continued focus on regional identity counterproductive to wider aims for integration? Do regional rivalries such as Barcelona Madrid reduce the likelihood of cooperation and solidarity between these regions in non-sporting matters? Because we hear a lot of the fierce rivalry, but are there any instances of both sets of fans uniting for a common cause? So first of all, I believe that we humans need identity characteristics in order to define ourselves. 
Uh, this can be regional identity or identity through the social milieu or uh, uh, religion and so on. A football club is attractive to us because we can identify with them. So we can ask ourselves what identity characteristics are left of a club when regionality, social menu, and so on and so on are removed. Is this, the club still attractive then? The club is then only a color like uh, red or green or something like that. For me, it wouldn't be attractive. After all, identity does not have to end in hatred. No, I think um, we have to learn to deal with the other, to respect and accept him or her. So for me, integration does not mean dissolving identity, but accepting and tolerating difference. And the sporting rivalry between Barcelona and Madrid is not the cause of social problems. On the other hand, the sporting rivalry between Barcelona and Madrid has its cause in social problems. Uh, it is therefore an expression of the constitution of society. If you take both clubs, um, um, Barcelona and Madrid, out of play, the social problems are not so solved then. No, the, the problems would still be there, but um, there would be no event where the pressure could be released. And so the sporting rivalry is an indicator that points us to some, something social. And as far as globalization is concerned, the globalization appears to me more of an economic project and less of a handshake uh, between countries and regions. And um, yes, there are certainly cases and projects in which different groups of fans unite for a common cause. For example, when uh, common goals are at stake. One example would be the fight against the total commercialization of football. And, and if we look at uh, international matches, fans, the fans always uh, keep their fingers crossed for their country, no matter if they are from Bavaria or from, from, from Württemberg or from Berlin. That's the end of our discussion for today, Adriano. Thank you so much for joining us. That was truly fascinating. Thank you for inviting me. Is there a way that people could engage with your research after this show? Can they, are you on social media, for example? Or can they go on your website? Uh, yes, they can go on a web website and then contact me, uh, like uh, com minus associates dot uh, com, and they have all the contact details. So, listeners, as an extension to the conversation we've just had with Adriano, we decided that we would discuss our own personal identities and how they've, I guess, been formed through our lived experiences. Because obviously, all of us are from different backgrounds in terms of region we all have different accents we all support different football clubs given that this is a football and society podcast and it's just interesting how we've all i guess arrived at supporting the clubs that we have Maine is quite straightforward i mean obviously the accents the giveaway born and raised in in gated left there when i was 18 but still newcastle united that relationship i developed with with them as a as a kid, is still very much a part of my life now, somewhat 20, God, 25 years later. And for me, football, it was, you know, something that was in my life from a very early age. Um, I was taken to my first Newcastle match at the age of nine in 1986, although I was always a, a football fan prior to that. I was playing football. I was very much aware of Newcastle because I'd already heard the tales that me... Um, Parents to me, granddad to about former Newcastle legends, and these these players like Jackie Milburn, who was from Ashen in the Pit Village up in the northeast, actually worked as a miner whilst he was a footballer for a period. Huey Gallagher, George Ribeiro, who was the first South American to to play in, in England, um, and Malcolm McDonald. And these these people kind of had a an otherworldly aspect to them. They were, they were I suppose, they were kind of like superheroes and these um, sort of significant historical figures as a child you you hold them up to to be exactly that and and obviously going to my first Newcastle match that was it um despite the fact that we lost 4-0 the, the kind of bond that I, that I felt immediately obviously uh, you know the nurturing up to that point had kind of led me to to this particular point it was always going to be a case of the first time I saw the black and white in the in the flesh I was going to kind of feel even more attached to them and, and I did the reality is that masculinity and constructive masculinity played a huge part in my life. And I, and I can only speak speak of it based on my experiences of the, the area that I'm from, the, 
the fact that my family are what you would call traditional working class in terms of their socioeconomic status and their, their jobs. And I felt very much like I had to kind of conform to these behavioural traits that I didn't necessarily want to, this sort of overtly hyper-masculine persona, this almost need to, to be tough and to act tough. And I was never like that. I was quite a, a sensitive kid. But through football, I, I felt this this bond with people who I don't think I would have had, I, I would have felt without without it um, because I, I felt like I had nothing in common with them. So I can actually say that Newcastle United Football Club, despite the fact that football even now is a, is a site of hyper, hyper masculinity, was still for me a, a, bit, a bit of a saving grace. And as I say, I left the region at 18, but no matter where I've lived, and I haven't, I didn't just leave the region at 18 and move to one place and stay there. I've been, you know, I've lived abroad on numerous occasions, lived in different parts of the UK, and I still feel like, to a certain extent, I'm defined by, I guess, what I would call me Geordiness. Not necessarily how I define myself, is a, you know, because because it, it could be restrictive or it's, I guess, it's it's homogen, it's homogenizing a, a whole region, but definitely other people. I've felt it and I still feel it now when they first encounter me, the, the moment they hear my accent, they form an opinion. Um, the moment that they, they look at me, they, they form an opinion. And, you know, it's something as, as ridiculous as tattoos now are kind of ubiquitous. Everyone's got them, like kind of a, fa- a fashion item almost. But back when I was younger, pe- people with tattoos, it was generally perceived that you were, you know, possibly violent or, or rough, I would say would be the word rough. So I even think now, despite all the, let's see it, advances we've made in, in understanding that people from different regions aren't necessarily defined by, you know, these the stereotypes that have been created. I still feel that I am to a certain to a certain extent. And right now, I, I don't feel like I, I adhere to this stereotype. And I don't think you find many Geordies who do adhere to this stereotype of what a Geordie is that other people have. But in a weird way, I do feel extremely connected to that part of the world. So it's a really elaborate confusing identity it's like i i am a geordie but at the same time i don't necessarily think i, I should be defined merely by the fact that i'm a geordie if you see what i mean um i still but even now actually you know what despite the fact i've been away for so many years like even now when when i hear a geordie accent on on tv or i see somebody who's from the region doing doing something that i perceive to be good or you know or, or they've achieved something i, I still get like a, a real sense of pride so it's a yeah it's, it's a mixed feeling that i have for for what being a Geordie is, I guess. I'll kind of tell my story, which in one respect is linked, because in spite of my accent, I, as you may know, uh, I'm, I'm a Newcastle fan as well, and that's Norman, how, how we, of course, know each other. I guess there's a couple of like variations on the story of how and why I became a Newcastle fan. So in spite of my Southern English accent, I actually grew up in Australia, so I had an accent from over there. Uh, and when I was over there, my dad came back from working on a on a contract in a factory in Gateshead and he came back with these these stories of this city that was obsessed with football even more obsessed than I was at the time and I, I played football in a little uh, team out there and the other thing that he kind of came back with was the stories of this amazing kind of black and white clad football team and these players like Dabajinla who was like a god uh, to them so when we when we ended up moving to the UK about a year or so later the kids at school as kids I want to do asked me the one of the opening things who's your name and what football club do you support so my memory of that kicked in and pretty much instantly well from recollection um i said well i support newcastle so that tends to be the kind of practice story that i'll tell people when they ask me why i support a club like newcastle that obviously i don't have a jolly accent like you norman um but i guess there are a couple of other reasons as well possibly a little bit more complex digging in a little bit deeper um, the second one is, is as a child, as I say, I lived in Australia, but my parents are, uh, my dad is South African and my mum was born in Kenya, but grew up in Scotland and South Africa. I also have siblings. So my brother's born in Singapore. And my sister is born in Australia. So there's no kind of one specific place because my family have moved around a lot. There's no one specific place that I feel I'm from. So very different to you, Norman. There's not that kind of sense of, home of connection in that way and those kind of multiple national community ties have always I think given me a bit of a sense of being in one way a bit of a kind of outsider in a lot of ways I'm very very privileged and very much an insider I'm white I'm straight I've got a degree I've got a kind of southern English accent and in the playground in Australia I cost my mum back I was the English kid and here when I moved here 
I was the Australian kid, and they used to ask me, uh, after asking me what football team I supported, to say lines from Neighbours in my funny accent, uh, which kind of really stuck in my mind. So I think that that sense of being, you know, not from one place or the other has kind of really caused me to quite enjoy and kind of celebrate that degree of difference and not being from either here or there, but kind of a lot of places equally. Uh, and I tend to, depending on what situation we're in, put on and take off hats of uh, national affiliation or identity. But for example, if you if we were talking about a rugby game, which international rugby team would you like to win this tournament? I'll kind of have a few options there. And depending on the fortunes of the situation, I might go for South Africa, Australia, or possibly England sometimes. Um, if you're talking about football, it's usually Australia with kind of as, um, England as my kind of backup option. And then I think the the final uh, the final reason that I possibly picked Newcastle is possibly the most obvious is that at the time, 95, 96, 97, Newcastle, a long time ago, were actually quite a good football side. So I guess in retrospect, probably a terrible choice. But at the time, there was probably a bit of glory hunting, <laughs> despite what the situation is now. Um, so yeah, it's probably all of those together. Um, I will kind of pick and choose which which one, depending on the situation, to kind of give you a nice, easily digestible, clean-cut reason. But it's probably all of those and probably more. I particularly relate to the feeling of the other, being half French, half English, and how people do emphasise that other aspect of you when you're in the other country, uh, for example. And that even feeds in into allegiance in a way. I feel I was probably never more supportive of the English football team than when I lived in France. Just because, yeah, you do feel like the outsider there and that becomes a bit of a stronger element of your identity. But the the aspect, the French side of me, actually, that really played quite a, a big factor in what football team I originally began with, uh, began supporting, which is Arsenal. And, but before that, um, the first event that really got me hooked on football was the 1998 World Cup in France when I was seven years old. And I'd only attended one live game at Colchester United. And I think I came away from that more bemused than anything. Uh, and then the World Cup came and that was the first time I got truly excited by football and the atmosphere surrounding the event. I remember Beckham's free kick Owen's goal against Argentina and being sent to bed at half time afterwards then my mum telling me England had lost at breakfast next morning. I think I even remember my teacher, I would have been year two I guess, saying something along the lines of that Mr Beckham was a very naughty man or something to the, the class next day and we hated her for it. But my mum's French and so I still had a team in it effectively and it's always good having two teams in the World Cup. Uh, and when France won the final that year, it was absolute chaos. My mum was screaming. Her friends were calling her. And again, there, she was almost the representative of France among her English fans, you know, who were personally ringing her up to congratulate her that evening. Uh, next day, I was really embarrassed as she took me to school with these tricolores painted all over her face. Uh, I shouldn't have been embarrassed, but as a very self-conscious seven-year-old, I was. But when I was then looking at the season preview in Match magazine, which my mum started buying me during the World Cup. The season preview for the season, I noticed there that quite a few players from the French squad, like Vieira and Emmanuel Petit, played for Arsenal. And that was it for me. Obviously, and similar to Chris here, I guess, it helped that Arsenal were pretty good too. My dad always reminded me that they just won the double. So I supported Arsenal from that moment. And then Colchester only truly came into my life during late secondary school. We actually got to our highest ever position in the championship while I was doing my GCSEs. That's the highest position ever for Colchester. And I was going all over the country with my dad to see Colchester in those days. Never Newcastle, unfortunately. And I think that Colchester actually became even more important to me while I was at university because I generally felt my attachment to my hometown at that point. You realise how many people from across the country support Arsenal and then those victories don't feel so very personal anymore. And I think maybe there's the element of the outsider there again. I also started to embrace with Colchester just the suffering involved in supporting them as opposed to the success. And one thing that started to irritate me about Arsenal fans was taking that success under Wenger uh, for granted almost. And Having grown up with Wenger, I think that was the kind of start where the start of my 
really kind of passionate support for Arsenal Dwayne, but that was filled with Colchester. Um, but with Colchester sitting in the almost empty stadium on the edge of town on a miserable day, you do kind of see yourself and all the other f- fans there, like the followers of this fading cult. And my dad once said to me, we don't come here to enjoy ourselves. And I think that's it. For me, I think I've grown up to realise the most important thing is that you feel so attached. You have to follow no matter what. Uh, And a perfect example uh, to finish being the other week when I watched them lose 6-1 to Exeter. 100% mate. (laughs) Thanks listeners. We will leave it there. Hope you've enjoyed this. 